Facebook. My name is Jessie Ann, and this is my dear friend Michaela. We were privileged as a worship team to have her come and do a vocal workshop for us a couple years ago now at our worship retreat, and now I am honored to have her join me to lead you all in some worship. So join with us and sing, Behold Him.
Morning Church. This reading is from Luke 15, uh, 11 to 32. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not longer, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What was going on? Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son... The father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. Greetings, church. Pleasure to be with you again. The title of the second sermon in this series on the prodigal son is entitled Coming Home to Love. Our parable begins with this statement. There was a man who had two sons. All you need in a story is to have a father with two sons, and you've got lots of drama. We don't need psychology or sociology or even human experience to tell us that. All we need is the Bible. There's Cain and Abel, drama, Jacob and Esau, Eliab and David, Absalom and Amnon, James and John. And the list goes on and on. And the reason why there's drama in every single story is because you've got a father and two sons, and one of the sons came out of the womb first, which means that that son is the oldest. That son has firstborn status, and therein lies the difficulty. If one son was born first, it means the other son is second. And nobody, by nature, likes to be second. Even if dad loves both boys equally, the older brother has been loved by his father longer. So, I'm a father with two sons. And I would say I love both Grady and Charlie equally, but... I cannot say that I've loved both boys the same amount of time. No, I've loved Grady at least two years longer. He has more history with me. Yes, Dad has known the firstborn and loved him first and therefore longer. So the older son 
will always struggle with a sense of entitlement, especially after the younger brother comes along. He'll never want his younger brother to excel him. The older brother will always find ways to keep his punk brother just that, his punk brother. So any success or achievement of the younger brother that wins the celebration of others, and particularly the celebration of the father, will be viewed as a threat to the status of the older brother. And so the older brother's relentless teasing and bullying of the younger brother will be his way of letting the younger brother know who's boss. Now, the younger brother, the second born, will naturally love his older brother because he will look up to him and he will hate him at the same time. He will want to be like his older brother some of the time, but only until he realizes that he will never really be able to achieve firstborn status. Then he will try to be as unlike his older brother as is humanly possible. <laughs> Feeling the pain of never quite measuring up to his older brother, he'll say, screw this, I'm not even gonna try, I'm out of here. And the younger brother will be more prone to outright rebellion. The older brother will be sort of a good boy, but not the second born. You know, the breaking of the rules kind of rebellion. I mean, what's the use of coloring in the lines if when I try, it's never as good as my older brother? So I will just be a scribbler. The younger brother will find his own unique path, and in many ways that will be good. It will be important for him. He will have to create his own successes, his own style, his own status. He will work very hard at this. But sometimes the heroic journey of the younger brother will lead him into the distant country. But this too will be necessary ultimately for his salvation. The younger brother's rebellion will also reinforce the sense of superiority in the older brother's heart. Appendix A, the prodigal son. But herein lies the problem with both brothers, whether you're younger or older, and we see it here in this story. They are both seeking their identity outside of their relationship with their father. The younger son, doubting his true identity as the beloved heir of the father, seeks to find his true self in money. He seeks to look outside of the farm. He doesn't believe that life with his father can be a good life, so he looks elsewhere. And this is evidenced in his demand of his inheritance before his father is dead. What he really wants is the freedom that comes from leaving home. He wants to be free from family. He wants to be free from his father. Now, last weekend, in message number one, we ended up with the picture of the younger son coming to his senses and coming home to be met uh, in the open arms of his father. While in the pigsty, after blowing his inheritance, the younger son realized that the pigs actually had it off a lot better than him. And so he developed a plan in the pigsty to save himself. He got himself into this mess he would now have to get himself out. This is normal thinking for everybody who doesn't understand salvation by grace alone through faith alone. He knows that his face-saving plan would result in deep humiliation, but he's willing to face the village gauntlet, even if it means that he, at least for a while, can learn a trade, get a job, and survive starvation. He doesn't believe that true forgiveness from his father is possible. He doesn't believe that reconciliation with his dad and his older brother is possible. So he's happy to simply be a hired hand. The shame resulting from his sin is clouding the way he looks at everything. So he's not able to see that the real problem is not his life of debauchery or his rule breaking, but rather it's his independence from the father. Nor does he understand the depth of his father's compassion for him. How can he? 
So using theological terms, we would say that his anthropology is broken, his understanding of himself. His theology is broken, his understanding of God. And as a result, his soteriology is broken, his understanding of salvation. What we will see from our story today is coming to grips with all three is necessary for genuine conversion to take place. What we see in this story is the surprising nature of God. I find it interesting that the Muslims use this story of the prodigal son to show Christians that salvation doesn't require a mediator or a savior. No middleman is necessary. You've got God here, and you've got humanity here, and the two can come together without any kind of atoning sacrifice. Here's what they say. Look, the younger son simply comes to his senses, returns home on his own steam, and the father simply receives him. There's no Jesus, there's no sacrificial death, there's no shedding of blood, there's no atonement. It's completely unnecessary. Are our Muslim friends right? No, we don't believe they're right. We believe that the exact opposite is true. As the prodigal returns home, he expects his father to be aloof, distant, angry, cold. Once the word gets out that the father's estate has been squandered in Gentile territory, he would have been blacklisted by the whole community. He would have been subject to the kazeza ritual, where they would break a pot in front of the whole community and they would say, you are now cut off from everybody in this community. Kenneth Bailey writes, upon returning home, the son would be obliged to sit for some time outside the city gate of the family home without even seeing his father at all. After sufficient time, he would be summoned. With the boy already rejected by the entire village, the father would be very angry and the boy would be obliged to apologize for everything as he pleaded for job training in the next village. In the ancient Middle East, the whole community always acts as one. The whole community, along with the father, had been humiliated. humiliated. And the whole community will now demand justice. Call it a first century version of cancel culture. But this is not what happens. Seeing his son from a distance and not knowing anything about the son's heart condition, the father breaks with Oriental tradition and runs to meet his son. The father runs. The Greek word used for the word run is he races. The father races to meet his son. Who is he racing against? He's racing against the town villagers who might get to the son first and shame him to death. He can't get to his son fast enough. This would have been very undignified and humiliating for an elderly Jewish man to run like this. This would have been something that he had not done for years. He wouldn't have needed to run at this stage in his life with his outer robe now completely discarded and his undergarment pulled up uh, with his hands revealing his naked legs, the act of running would have appeared painfully shameful to an elderly, usually distinguished father in first century Palestine. Why does he do this? The father knows the disgrace that's awaiting his son as he walks through the village with his head bowed. Yet moved with compassion, the father takes upon himself the humiliation and disgrace that's due his son. The picture of the father leaving home and racing towards his wayward son is a picture of God incarnate running towards lost humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. He does not wait for the prodigal to get to him. He doesn't wait for the prodigal to arrive home. 
but at great cost to himself, he mercifully embraces his son. The Greek implies that he repeatedly kissed him over and over and over. And in doing so, he raises his son from the dead. This act of compassionate humiliation is a public act. Think of the cross. There are villagers and servants watching this unusual scene of the father running towards his son. The father turns to one of them and says, quick, make haste. Before the villagers even have a chance to pronounce their verdict, I'm going to pronounce my verdict on this son. That my son has been fully restored to the family. Bring the robe and cover him. Bring the signet ring. Identify him. He's mine. Bring the sandals and restore him. And we're not having goat tonight. No, kill the fatted calf. For tonight we celebrate that my son who was dead has come back to life. My son who was lost has now been found. There's no Kazeza ceremony tonight, not in this town. We're going to replace it with a party. Do you see the cross in this story? Yeah. The public humiliation of the innocent? The righteous suffering on behalf of the unrighteous? The judge, the father, bearing the shame of the offender, the younger brother? The robe of one man's righteousness being imputed to the sinful naked shoulders of another? Yeah, we see in the prodigal son paragraph, God in Christ reconciling the world to himself and doing so at great cost. So what effect does this extravagant action of the father have on the son? Did you notice something that following this deep, humiliating race towards the young son, the, the embrace, the kissing, and all of that, that when the son finally comes up for air, that he changes his speech? Yeah, remember the speech that he wrote en route back to the farm? He drops the last line, the line about simply being a hired hand. Hmm. After such a demonstration of self-sacrificing love, being a servant or a hired hand is no longer an option. It would be impossible. The prodigal son now has a choice to make. He will either receive his father's full forgiveness, choosing to live within this new world of grace, or he will leave home for good. That's what the offer of salvation does to people. You see, there are privileges and responsibilities that accompany such grace. But simply being a servant or a hired hand or somebody who works for hire, it's no longer an option. It's you are a son or a daughter or you are nothing. Simply opting to be a servant who works for hire no longer makes sense in this kind of family of grace. The son, in effect, receives his father's gift of humility, knowing that it's pure, undeserved grace. And the prodigal son is transformed by love. He's transformed in the arms of his father. We would say he's converted. <laughs> he's not converted in the pig pen. He's not cons converted while suffering. He's converted in the arms of his father. Tim Keller, one of my favorite authors, tells the story of a woman who came up to him after he preached a sermon about this kind of grace. Here's what she said. She said that she had gone to church her whole life growing up and had always heard that God accepts us only if we are sufficiently good and ethical. 
She had never heard this kind of message that she was now hearing, that we can be accepted by God by sheer grace alone through the work of Christ, regardless of anything we do or regardless of anything we have done in the past. And here's what she said. That, talking about grace, that is a scary idea. Oh, it's good scary, but it's still scary. I was intrigued, said Keller. So I asked her what was so scary about unmerited free grace. And she replied something like this. Well, if I was saved by my good works, by what I did, then there would be a limit to what God could ask of me or put me through. I would be like a taxpayer with certain rights. I would have done my duty, and now I would have a certain quality of life. But if it is really true that I am a sinner that can't save myself by good works, and I'm saved by the sheer grace of God alone, at God's infinite cost of Christ, then there's nothing that he cannot ask of me. She could immediately see that the wonderful beyond belief teaching of salvation by sheer grace alone had two edges to it. On the one hand, yes, it cut away slavish fear. God loves us freely despite our flaws and failures. Yet she could also see that if Jesus had really done this for her, she was no longer her own. She was bought with a price. Whenever we accept Jesus into our life and make a decision to follow him, we never just receive him as Savior, though he is that, gloriously so. No, you cannot separate the two offices of Jesus. He is both Savior who deals with our sins and reconciles us back to God. But he is also our Lord. When he saves us, he now has complete rights over us. He's purchased us. We're his. And so like the slaves in the Old Testament, we get one ear pierced, identifying ourselves as the permanent belongings, the permanent belonging, the permanent slave of our master. Here's my question. Have you submitted your life to this wonderful God who through Christ has done all the heavy lifting to make you his? Have you put out the welcome mat for him? If you haven't, why don't you do that today? You can simply pray a prayer that sounds something like this. Lord, Jesus, Thank you for humbly becoming one of us and dying in our place and rising from the dead in order to reconcile us back to you. I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And today, I repent of my sin. I confess that I need you. And I choose to follow you not only as my Savior, but as my Lord from this day forward. If that prayer expresses the desire of your heart, I encourage you to talk to one of your pastors and ask them to lead you to take the important next step of baptism, where you will not only publicly identify with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but in a very mysterious way, you will enter into a sacramental union with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. For those of us who have already made that decision, let's experience the joy of the Lord that comes with knowing we're his at such a great cost. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Christ my Savior and my 